right now. Getting the care you need is more important than ever. That's why we're bringing care directly to people no matter where they live. Creating virtual ICU teams that reduce unnecessary hospital transfers, reduce the burden on families, and save lives. Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies, caring for patients wherever they are, for the health of America. Hi everyone, I hope you're all taking good care of yourselves. My name is Lauren Underwood. I represent Illinois' 14th Congressional District, and I'm so excited to welcome you to today's Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Annual Legislative Conference Session on Advancing Black Maternal Health, Moving the Mommy Bus, and Coverage Expansion Forward. I would like to start by thanking the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association for sponsoring this session. Thank you for your commitment to this critically important issue. I would also like to thank this inspiring group of Black women who are joining me for today's event. Stacey Abrams, the founder of Fair Fight Action and a leading voice in our national conversation on racial justice and equity. Congresswoman Terry Sewell, the first Black woman to ever serve in the Alabama Congressional Delegation and a Chief Deputy Whip in the 116th Congress. Congresswoman Robin Kelly, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, the lead sponsor of the Justice for Incarcerated Moms Act and the first woman of color to be elected to Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And Congresswoman Lucy McBath, the lead sponsor of the Social Determinants for Moms Act and a Black maternal health champion with deeply personal connections to this work. I can't wait to talk with this dynamic group of leaders, and I hope their stories will not only deepen your understanding of this issue, I hope you will be moved to action and advocacy. Because we know the Black maternal health crisis in the United States demand action, serious action immediately from all of us. We live in the wealthiest nation on earth. Our scientists lead the world in breakthrough discoveries, our nurses and doctors are trusted with the most difficult and cutting edge medical procedures, and our research institutions attract scholars from every continent. And yet, despite all of that, our moms are dying. Our moms are dying at the highest rate of any country in the developed world. And while maternal mortality falls around the world, the rate is increasing here. For as dire as the situation is overall, it's so much worse for African Americans. Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women, a disparity that transcends education level, income, or any other demographic factor. In fact, a black woman with a college degree is more likely to die from giving birth than a white woman who dropped out of high school. And behind every one of these statistics is a story. The women joining me for today's event have their own connections to this issue, and I have mine. Her name was Dr. Shalon Irving. She was a classmate and good friend from my MPH program at Johns Hopkins University. She went on to become an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and a Lieutenant Commander in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps. In January 2017, Shalon gave birth to her beautiful daughter, Soleil. And just three weeks later, she collapsed and passed away due to complications from high blood pressure related to her pregnancy. She was just 36 years old. Shalon and women with stories like hers are why I do this work. It's why I co-founded the Black Maternal Health Caucus with Congresswoman Alma Adams in April 2019. And it's why I introduced the Black Maternal Health Mommybus Act with Senator Kamala Harris and Representative Adams in March of 2020. The Mommybus includes nine bills that build on existing maternal health legislation to comprehensively address the Black maternal health crisis in America. Shortly, you'll see a video with other members of our caucus talking about the policies in the mommy bus that they championed, from investing in community-based organizations to growing and diversifying the perinatal workforce. But the mommy bus is not the only legislation that we must pass to address this crisis. We cannot have a conversation about improving Black maternal health outcomes in America without talking about Medicaid coverage. Not only does Medicaid cover 43% of births in the United States, it covers 66% of African American births. Currently, Medicaid coverage for pregnant people cuts off two months after the last day of a pregnancy. However, 
the majority of pregnancy-related deaths happen after the day of delivery, and nearly one quarter of pregnancy-related deaths happen more than six weeks postpartum. In my state of Illinois, one-third of maternal deaths take place more than six weeks after delivery. By extending coverage for pregnant people from 60 days after delivery to one year, moms will be able to receive the care they need and deserve for the full postpartum period. And later, you're gonna hear about this policy from Representative Robin Kelly, who has been the leading voice in Congress on expanding Medicaid for pregnant people for many years. But first, I'd like to share a video summary of the Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus, which I introduced with my colleagues in March of this year. Congresswoman Underwood, uh, just an another problem you're, you're working to tackle, and it's a problem that has really been underserved in many ways, and that is maternal mortality, especially in the African-American community. Uh, tell us, uh, you're rolling out the Momnibus bill, That's and it's right. actually nine bills trying to attack That's this right. problem. Tell us about it. In the United States of America, black women are four times, three to four times more likely to die as a result of childbirth in this country, a statistic that has remained unchanged for the last three decades and the United States is actually leading the industrial world uh, in this elevated maternal mortality rate. We need to be investing in this perinatal workforce, uh, uh, solving some of the mental health challenges uh, that women face. And you know there's a lot of conversation about postpartum depression, but there's also you know anxiety, there's other mental health disorders, there's substance use disorders, and we need to make sure that there's a targeted focused effort on solving uh, those new moms challenges they are giving them the resources to do so. This is a crisis for all American women, and it's especially pronounced for black women. Behind each of these alarming statistics is a tragic story. Stories like my friend, Dr. Shalon Irving, a CDC epidemiologist and Lieutenant Commander in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, who died three weeks after giving birth to her first child, a beautiful girl named Soleil. Stories like Kira Johnson, who you'll hear about from Congresswoman Adams. Today is for Shalon, it's for Kira, and every other mom who's lost her life, or come close to it, trying to bring a life into the world. I am proud to be the lead sponsor on the Bipartisan Protecting Moms Who Served Act, which ensures that women who have worn the uniform of the United States can get the prenatal and postpartum care that they have earned. The other bills are led by fearless members of the Black Maternal Health Caucus, who you'll hear from today from centering the voices of people who have been affected by this crisis to collaborating with community-based organizations, patient advocacy organizations, think tanks, providers, hospitals, and insurers, we built a broad coalition. And we are grateful that the Momnibus has been endorsed by over 100 organizations. For me, this work began when my daughter, a black mom herself, survived a complicated pregnancy that almost claimed her life. I also want to take a moment to speak about the bill that I'm leading within the package, the Kira Johnson Act. Kira was an entrepreneur. She traveled the world, and she was a mother to a healthy little boy. On April 12, 2016, she checked into a hospital with her husband, Charles, to give birth to their second child, Langston. Despite being in excellent health, Kira did not make it out alive. Kira Johnson mattered. Kira deserved better. And this legislation says unequivocally that black moms matter. Yesterday, I introduced the Social Determinant for Moms Act. This legislation will harness the power of the federal government to address the social and economic factors that lead to negative outcomes for maternal health and address some of the disparities that are seen in maternal health throughout all of America. And we have to hold our medical professionals and our healthcare system accountable for, um, for making sure that we are not just dealing with the issue of quality, but we're talking about equity of care. For new mothers of color, a mental health crisis already plagued by stigma and stereotypes compounds the deeply entrenched racism woven through our maternal health system. 
for two systems, both in desperate need of dignity, equity, justice. The Moms Matter Act will bring just that. It will establish a task force focused on improving mental health and substance use disorder outcomes, and back that talk up with action by providing federal dollars to implement best practices. I'm proud to introduce the Data to Save Moms Act, which will improve data collection to better understand the causes of maternal health, cri the, the maternal health crisis in our country, and will inform the solutions that we need to address it. Importantly, it combats the shameful mortality rate for black moms and native moms. It helps ensure that we have a full picture of the maternal outcomes for all women of color. 80% of incarcerated women are mothers and 5% of incarcerated women arrive at prison pregnant. These women are usually most at risk for maternal health complications, denied critical bonding time with their newborns, and face physical and mental health complications exacerbated by inadequate health care. The Justice for Incarcerated Moms Act would help to change that by creating systems to protect the health of incarcerated women and list them as partners in our fight for justice and equity. At, uh, one of my bills, the Perinatal Workforce Act, uh, was included in this fantastic uh, momnibus package. Wow. And so this bill would provide grant program uh, for doulas and midwives and lactation specialists uh, black nurses, and to try to make sure we diversify the workforce. The solution of the momnibus must be understood in the context of America's history. Because if we are to do what is right going forward, we must remember where we have been. And then understand in that context what the leaders on this stage are doing to create a path that corrects while acknowledging what has been done and what needs to be done going forward. I am so proud to stand with the leaders on this stage. Black maternal health is not a partisan issue. It's a life and death issue. The main goal of the caucus is to develop and advance evidence-based policy solutions. And today, we've met that goal. Well, now that you've learned more about the Momnibus, we want to hear from you. Join the conversation on Twitter throughout today's event. Our first question is, what are you hoping to learn about the Black maternal health crisis in America during today's session? We also want to thank our sponsor, the American Hospital the Association, Association, for their generosity, their generosity and support on this issue. At this time, I'd like to introduce a New York Times best-selling author, serial entrepreneur, nonprofit CEO, and political leader, Stacey Abrams. After serving for 11 years in the Georgia House of Representatives, Seven of them as Democratic leader, Stacey became the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia, winning more votes than any other Democrat in the state's history. Stacey was the first Black woman to become the gubernatorial nominee for a major party in the United States, and she was the first woman and first Georgian to deliver a response to the State of the Union. After witnessing the gross mismanagement of the 2018 election by sec the Secretary of State's office, Stacey launched Fair Fight to ensure every American has a voice in our election system through programs such as Fair Fight 2020, an initiative to fund and train voter protection teams in 20 battleground states. There is so much more that I could say about my friend Stacey Abrams, but I want to make sure that you can hear from her. Stacey, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely, Laura. Representative Underwood, it's an honor to be with you. Well, the Black maternal health crisis is an issue that you've been focused on for a long time. What motivated you to start this work? I grew up in Mississippi. I'm the second of six children. And I heard stories from my mom, from my grandmother, from my cousins about how difficult it is for Black women to navigate the most fundamental question of giving birth and surviving, bringing life into this world. As a state legislator, it was brought to my attention very early on how poorly the state of Georgia does in the area of maternal mortality. And as the Democratic leader in the House, part of my responsibility was not simply to hear these stories, but to push our caucus and to push our state to action. And so this for me has been a process and I'm just so proud of the work that you've been willing to do on the congressional level to lift this issue up and bring attention to it around the country. 
Well, thank you. Now, we know that the United States has a maternal mortality health crisis nationally, and you just mentioned Georgia has some particularly glaring disparities. During your time as House Minority Leader in the Georgia General Assembly, you were a champion for Medicaid and other policies to promote health equity. What do you see as the key drivers of disparities in your state? Well, I'm going to talk about Georgia, and I'm going to talk about the South writ large. I know you have uh, Congresswoman Sewell from Alabama, and you work very closely, of course, with uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams. And what we have to understand is that 60 percent, 58 percent technically, of Black people live in the South. And so when I talk about Georgia, it is an emblem, it is emblematic of what's happening across the region where most Black women live. We know that Georgia is 35th among states for health outcomes, but we're in the bottom four for access to clinical care and to high quality access. We have nine counties in Georgia that do not have a single doctor. We have 76 counties without an OBGYN. We have 60 counties without a pediatrician. And we know that 60% of the deaths under maternal mortality are preventable and occur after birth. But I think the most important piece is that these are solvable problems if we expanded access to Medicaid. And unfortunately, with the exception of Louisiana, across the South, Medicaid does not exist for the vast majority of people who need it. In Georgia, we have 1.4 million people who live without health insurance but we have almost half a million who could be covered if we expanded Medicaid. This is a matter of life or death, and the expansion of Medicaid, particularly for moms, could cover their postpartum needs, could make certain that they got the prenatal care they needed, but most importantly, to your point about expanding coverage for a year, it would actually save lives. It would save not only the lives of those mothers, it would save families and it would save us money. And so whether you do it because of the moral good or the economic good, maternal mortality makes good sense. Or solving maternal mortality. It makes good sense. Yes. Yes. So I was so excited to have your support on the Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus Act that I introduced in March. My bill would focus on investing in social determinants of health, growing and diversifying the perinatal workforce, investing in community-based organizations, improving our data collection processes, and more. Why do you think it's important that we advance comprehensive and targeted solutions like the Mommy Bus? Because we know that these aren't single-strand problems. These are multi-strand problems that require the kind of solution that you're offering, the omnibus solutions that you're offering, because we have to recognize that if you don't have good data, you cannot build good policies. If you do not have practitioners who can deliver those policies, the policies are irrelevant. If you don't have the revenue necessary to invest, and if we allow communities to be discarded because of mistakes, such as the incarcerated population, we know that we lose the opportunity to build stronger families to build stronger communities and to build stronger states. In Georgia, we have 155,000 women who sit in that gap, who do not have access to health care. And the kind of solution that you're proposing wouldn't just help one of them or five of them, you could help all of them. And that's what's so important. What you have, what you pull together is a conversation for all women, for all who give birth, but also for all who rely on women giving birth to make certain that their families can survive. And we're working hard to pass this bill in Congress, but there's other important policies we need to be thinking about as well, like extending postpartum Medicaid, as you spoke about, to the full year after birth instead of 60 days. Now, Georgia is one of the states that hasn't expanded Medicaid, as you mentioned. So why would extending postpartum coverage specifically be important in your state? And why is it important that states like Georgia that haven't yet expanded Medicaid do so immediately? So as I pointed out, we've got 1.4 million people without health insurance. We've got half a million that are in the Medicaid who, who would be covered by Medicaid. 155,000 of those are women. And that matters because when women get access to health care, when they get access to that postpartum support, they are more likely to survive. 60% of the deaths in Georgia are preventable. And if they had access to that insurance, if they had access to the services, but we also have to understand that Georgia is one of those states, and I think Illinois has, un, has been fortunate in being able to mitigate some of this harm, where we are losing rural hospitals. We've lost seven since 2010. We have two that have announced closures during a pandemic. And we know that in Georgia, Black women have doubled the rate of maternal mortality deaths of white women. 
But if you're rural and black, it's 30% more likely that you will pass away from maternal mortality than if you are a black woman living in an urban area. And all of this comes together around the notion that if we had healthcare that actually covered you, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, then when you give birth, you are doing the work of bringing life into the world. You are not worried about whether you will survive the challenge. Yes. So what do you think we need to do to elevate this issue like the Black maternal health crisis as a national priority? So in addition to the work I do with Fair Fight on voter suppression, I actually launched two organizations, Fair Count, which is around the census and the Southern Economic Advancement Project. And one of our missions is to make certain we connect the dots. The census is an extraordinary way to make certain we have the resources to support the work that you're doing. But even more importantly, we have to talk about it. People don't think about maternal mortality and they don't understand just how, how deeply it affects our communities. And so it's the work that you're doing, the conversation we're having today, it's arming people with the information so that they embed it in what they talk about when they go to the polls to vote and when they go to visit their legislators after the elections, that's the time to talk about it. And not just to say, here's the problem, but to demand that their, their leaders provide answers. And so you talked about uh, your two organizations. I wanna drill down on Fair Fight Action. Uh, what are your plans between the coming months between now and November 3rd? So I'm working on making sure that we have access to the right to vote. We have to understand that voter suppression isn't one thing. It's much like the, the solution that you've offered. We have to think about this as an omnibus set of issues. Can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you cast a ballot? And can you get your ballot counted? And we are in the phase of this fight where it's critical that people remember to make a plan. Don't panic, make a plan. We have 40 plus states that allow for uh, absentee balloting, voting by mail, use it. We have 41 states that allow you to vote early and everyone can vote on election day. But start with the safest, most accessible way to vote, which is voting by mail, and then make a plan in case that doesn't work. You've got a plan for voting early, and if that doesn't work, you've got a plan to show up. But what we have to remember is that the solutions to our problems, we have to protest, we have to notify ourselves and lift up those issues, but the way we get the solutions embedded into our policies is by going to vote. And I'm gonna put in the plug, we also need to complete the 2020 census by September 30th, because that is how we get not only the resources we need, but it's how we get to elect extraordinary leaders who can represent our communities. If we aren't counted, we don't count and we don't get the representation we need. Well, thank you, Stacy. As I wrap up our conversation, one final question. If someone watching our event today wants to make a difference on the issue of black maternal health, what would you advise them to do? Number one, make certain you are talking to those running for the state legislature. Talk to them about what they're willing to do on Medicaid expansion and on maternal health. Do not let them wiggle out of the conversation. Number two, have the conversation with your congressman and your congresswomen. Most of the congresswomen know what they need to do, so it's probably talking to the congressman. But more than that, offer your help. The work that folks like you are doing, the work that the congresswomen who are going to be on after me are doing, it can only be amplified if people of goodwill and good intention actually talk about it with you, support you in your endeavors. You've done extraordinary work for someone who's only been in office for two years, and I can't wait to see what you can do when we have people across this country who not only believe in the work that you're doing, but believe it's the right work that needs to be done. Well, Stacey Abrams, thank you for joining us and for all of your efforts to save our democracy and to save our moms. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Underwood. It's my honor. Thank you. So thank you so much to Stacey Abrams for joining me for today's event. Now that you've heard from Leader Abrams, our second Twitter question is, how do we elevate the Black maternal health crisis as a top issue in this election? I'm now excited to introduce four of my fearless House colleagues to continue the conversation. I wanna start by introducing Congresswoman Terry Sewell, who has represented Alabama's seventh district since 2011. Representative Sewell is a chief deputy whip and sits on the prestigious steering and policy committee in addition to being a co-chair of the CDC's Voting Rights Task Force. We're also joined by Congresswoman Robin Kelly, who's represented Illinois' second congressional district since 2013. Representative Kelly is the co-chair of the Congressional Gun Violence Task Force, I'm sorry, Gun Violence Prevention Task Force, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust, 
and co-chair of the Congressional Caucus on Women, Black Women and Girls. Next, we have Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, a first-term member of Congress from the 7th District of Massachusetts. Representative Presley is an advocate, a policymaker, an activist, and a survivor. She is also a founding member of the Black Maternal Health Caucus. And finally, I'd like to introduce another fellow member of my freshman class, Congresswoman Lucy McBath, who represents Georgia's 6th District. She's already accomplished so much in, our, in her first term in Congress, including getting the Haven Act, her bill to protect veterans in need, signed into law. But she's always said that the most important title she'll ever hold is Jordan's mom. I'd like to begin this conversation with a question for Congresswoman Sewell. You serve as a co-chair of the Ways and Means Committee's Rural and Underserved Communities Health Task Force. What are some of the unique challenges facing pregnant and postpartum people in rural and underserved communities? And what policy solutions do you think will be most important to improve maternal health outcomes in those communities? Well, first, thank you so much, uh, Congresswoman Underwood, for your unwavering commitment to our nation's mothers and babies. As a daughter of Alabama's Black Belt, where women have had some of the poorest access to quality prenatal and reproductive care in this country. This is a sobering topic for me. And I know that it's true for the other colleagues on this, um, on this uh, panel as well. Uh, this has been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic we are currently enduring. We are a community that is heartbroken over the disproportionality of the number of deaths and those confirmed cases that are in the Black community. This has only been exacerbated when we think about the health outcome, particularly with Black women and um, uh, maternal mortality. But to answer your question, uh, I think the first thing that we have to do is obviously pass the Black Maternal Health Momnibus. This is critically important uh, to uh, getting at uh, the core issue, um, which is obviously uh, reducing the number of deaths that are, as has been said, 60% of which have been totally preventable. When I think about uh, my role on Ways and Means as co-chair of the Rural and Underserved Health Task Force, I think there are two ways uh, that we can be um, uh, helpful when it comes to reducing the number of deaths uh, among Black women uh, in uh, mortality as well as reproductive care. Uh, first is access. Um, social determinants of health are critically important. We know that um, while there's no consensus in this bipartisan um, uh, Ways and Means um, task force. I do have as my co-chairs, Danny Davis, who represents urban Chicago, as well as two Republicans, uh, Jody Arrington of, Ten of Texas, as well as um, Dr. Um, Brad Winstrup of Ohio. And while we're not, uh, we, we don't agree on the expansion of Medicaid, I think the number one thing that we can do when it comes to access uh, is to not only extend the number of days uh, after a woman gives birth, uh, expanding Medicaid number of days, but the expansion of Medicaid period in states of the South. Um, as Stacy so eloquently said, when I think about my rural areas, uh, I've seen more hospital closures, uh, even during the middle of a pandemic, occur in my district. Uh, and currently, five out of the 10 uh, counties that I represent don't have an OBGYN uh, in those counties. That means that so many of our African-American women and rural women uh, are struggling uh, to get access to qualified physicians in those areas. And when you don't have rural hospitals and you don't have physicians located there, those are two really horrible problems. Um, we need to expand Medicaid in the South. Um, not only is it a problem for uh, me in Alabama, I know that Lucy McBath from Georgia will agree that expanding Medicaid is something that we can do that would be very helpful. Um, the reality is that in Alabama alone, there are 600,000 Alabamians that would benefit, 150,000 women that would, would benefit directly from expanding Medicaid. Um, and that's gonna be our life cause. Um, the second thing that we've been focusing in on the rural uh, underserved task force uh, is the lack of physicians, right? So the diversity within the medical profession generally. That's something that we do agree on. Um, the reality is that so many of the resident slots go to urban areas and not to rural areas. That would be helpful if we can do that. Likewise, um, the statistics show that when we have more uh, people of color serving in the medical profession, we have better health, health outcomes. 
that would be true. And so when I think about our role within Ways and Means on the Rural and Underserved Task Force, I think that if we can expand Medicaid, if we can uh, increase diversity uh, in the medical profession, and then thirdly, access, uh, transportation access. Um, when I think about the fact that uh, so many of my rural communities, folks don't have public transportation to get to places, right? And so the reality is that people are dying on their way to the hospital. Um, this is so important that we uh, address it dead on. Um, that's non-emergency transportation as well as emergency transportation. Um, we have to think out of the box, leveraging Uber and uh, Lyft and making sure that those are totally reimbursable uh, is another way that we can get uh, better health outcomes. So in all, it's an honor for me to be here uh, with my fellow colleagues. I want to commend you, Lauren, uh, for really hitting the ground running when it comes to this. Uh, I think that it's so important. All of us have stories to tell of folks that have died in childbirth unnecessarily. 60% of those deaths are preventable. Let's roll up our sleeves and do the hard work of preventing it. Well, Terry, thank you for your lead. Leadership uh, for joining us in the caucus and for really driving forward so much of this work uh, to make sure that all of our residents, all of our constituents, including those in our rural communities, have access, truly have access to the care that they need. Um, Congresswoman Kelly, I'd love to bring you into the conversation now. As the chair of the CBC Health Brain Trust, you've been a longtime Black maternal health champion, and you've been especially focused on extending postpartum Medicaid coverage from 60 days to one year. Can you describe why this policy is so critically important? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Lauren, for all of your work, and as has already been said, for hitting the ground running. You've done a great job, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this very important issue that has such a huge impact on our community. According to uh, the Kaiser Fa Family Foundation, nearly half of all births in the United States are covered by Medicaid. Currently in our own home state of Illinois, 56% of pregnancy-associated deaths occurred between 43 and 364 days postpartum. This means that under current Medicaid law, low-income women are entering the most dangerous part of their postpartum journey right at the time when their health coverage is expiring. We know that expanding Medicaid through the entire postpartum period is a proven way to save mothers' lives. We have the data. States that have expanded Medicaid through the ACA, as well as states that have expanded maternal health coverage, uh, windows both have lower rates of maternal mortality. And we know that 70% of new moms will have at least one physical or psychological complication within a year of giving birth. So we all agree that new moms should be covered while pregnant and giving birth and after giving birth. This is why we must add 10 more months. Medicaid coverage to cover new moms for the entire postpartum period. So moms and their babies get a good healthy start. And like you said, we've been, we've been working on this and working on this. We have our Helping Moms Act, HR 4996, that will provide uh, states uh, to expand coverage for new moms under their Medicaid program for one year postpartum. This bill would also require MACPAC to report on the coverage of doula care under the state Medicaid programs. This is important. As you know, I don't have to tell you because many studies have shown the support of doula post-birthing has a positive effect, which reduces maternal mortality and lowers rates of C-sections, which are associated with higher rates of maternal mortality. One thing I also wanna say, which you know because you represent Illinois, is we're losing our hospitals in the urban areas. When I think about the south side of Chicago now, there's only three hospitals that you can give birth in, and you know it's getting scary even with some of those hospitals. So it, it's it's very scary what's going on for Black moms. And you know I have a, two daughters that haven't given birth yet, and it's scary thinking about you know it was safer for me to give birth than it is for them. So thank you so much again, and I salute all my colleagues and their work. Well, thank you, Congresswoman Kelly, for joining us. Congratulations on the legislative success of the Helping Moms Act. Uh, we're so excited um, to see that move forward. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so Congresswoman Presley, let's bring you in. You're the lead sponsor of the Justice for Incarcerated Moms Act and the Mommybus, which focuses on maternal health disparities in the criminal justice context. How do you see your leadership on Black maternal health issues intersect with some of the larger conversations our country's been having about racial justice? Sure, well, first, I just want to say thank you um, 
history maker in your own right for being a pace setter on this issue and honoring um, with great conviction the tradition of the Congressional Black Caucus as the conscience of the Congress and sounding the alarm on this public health crisis, which should capture um, the attention of the entire nation. Although it is a crisis for black women, um, this is a public health emergency um, that has everything to do with um, the, the, uh, the biases and the structural racism embedded within our healthcare system. And so we have to confront that. Um, also, um, uh, since we're saying names, and I think it's important to say those names, um, you know, my grandmother, I never had the honor of meeting her, my paternal grandmother, Carrie Presley. Um, she died in the 1950s, giving birth to my uh, father's uh, youngest brother. Um, it completely destabilized their family, and the fact that our outcomes, she died in the 1950s, have not improved, um, is just uh, staggering and devastating. So thank you all for your leadership and your partnership on this. And as for the Justice for Incarcerated Moms Act, which is a part of our larger uh, omnibus bill, you know, I am the adult child of a formerly incarcerated parent. And I know there are some that believe that social problems go to jail, but in fact, it is individuals. And uh, those individuals uh, come from families. And so it is very destabilizing uh, to community and to family. And so um, this is why the Justice for Incarcerated Moms Act does provide funding for states and municipalities to set up primary caretaker diversion programs as alternatives to incarceration for pregnant individuals and for primary caretakers for minor children. And then the other thing that I can't believe that we have to do, um, because we have to legislate compassion and justice, is that we incentivize, using the power of the purse, we incentivize states to end the practice of shackling pregnant individuals by tying federal funding eligibility to states that will enact anti-shackling laws. We have to legislate one that we have diversions and alternatives that so that incarcerated, we don't have incarcerated moms to begin with, and that um, when they are there and pregnant that they're not being shackled. These are the things we have to legislate. Um, the other thing the Justice for Incarcerated Mom uh, Bill requires is that it creates the first ever comprehensive study to really understand the scope of the maternal and infant a health crisis among incarcerated individuals. We all believe that the best policies are informed by data. And right now, um, and that drives where our resources go. And right now we don't have the data. We need a full picture, okay? Um, and so finally, the Justice for Incarcerated Moms provides funding for maternal health programs for incarcerated individuals in federal, state, and local prisons and jails, including access to doulas, healthy food and nutrition, mental health and substance use counseling, and strengthening visitation policies. So this is a, uh, a criminal justice issue. Uh, this is a healthcare justice issue, and it is a racial justice issue. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful that it could be a part of this larger momnibus bill. Well, Congresswoman Presley, thank you for your leadership and reminding all of us that we can't look away, right? What happens in America's prison happens in America and it has lasting impact on our communities and I thank you uh, for your fearlessness and raising it um, and being so precise in the policy solutions to these problems that you you've outlined here thank you so much um, I want to bring in Congresswoman Lucy McBath starting with your own story and connection to this issue can you describe your work on the Black Maternal Health Caucus your leadership on the Social Determinants for Moms Act in the Momnibus and why this bill is especially important during the COVID-19 pandemic well, first, uh, I want to thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you so much, uh, you and, and both uh, Representative Adams, for your tireless work on this issue and putting together this Momnibus package and also the panel today. Like many women in America, uh, my story includes a struggle to, to get pregnant. I lost two pregnancies and I also had a fetal demise before I was finally able to get uh, pregnant with my son, Jordan. He was a miracle for me and my family because I never really uh, was really sure whether or not I could actually have a child. But far too many, many mothers in America, and most specifically mothers of color like me, uh, the mir miracle of pregnancy basically ends in a sense of some, some sense of a tragedy. Now, I was fortunate to have very good insurance and a supportive employer and a family to help me actually 
uh, get through those difficulties. And I was able to take a leave of absence from my job. I was able to have access to the med best medical services that, that one can have. But I recognize that not every mother is likely uh, to have such great opportunities uh, for maternal care as I was. I recognize that not everyone has the same uh, level of uh, family and social support. And that's why I introduced the Social Determinants for Mom, uh, Moms Act, because I believe that every mother deserves to have a healthy and safe pregnancy. That is her right. This is America. And this bill brings all the resources of the federal government to bear on those inequities and determinants that really influence maternal health outcomes such as housing, uh, transportation, nutrition, and even the lack of access to healthcare providers. Uh, now more than ever, you know, this legislation, as, as my colleagues have said before, is truly, truly essential. It's long overdue and everyone deserves to have access to health care. And, you know, that's even more true during a pandemic. Uh, you know, as we've seen in COVID-19, uh, you know, COVID-19, it, it affects expectant mothers at a disproportionate rate, uh, especially women of color. Uh, it's been shown that expectant mothers with COVID-19 have a 50% higher chance of admission to intensive care and a 70% a uh, higher chance of being incubated as non-pregnant women. When you consider the health disparities and inequities uh, that are also tied to race with COVID-19, that spells a dire situation for expecting Black women all around the country. And as it was said earlier today, even with my, um, my good friend, uh, Stacey Abrams, as she has um, really set the example by talking about this, especially here in Georgia, we rank number two in the nation with the highest number of women that are dying during childbirth. And that's unacceptable. So I'm really grateful to be able to really concentrate on this legislation as part of the overall Momnibus package. It's, it's, it's so timely needed uh, and it's of its time. And I look forward to working with you and all of my colleagues as we expand this work. Well, Congresswoman Bath, thank you for joining us, for sharing your own connection to the issue um, and your deep commitment uh, to making sure that we solve these problems, these intersectional problems as you've described. So I want to bring our colleagues together for one final question. We're running out of time, but what I want to ask is for anyone who's listening and wants to get involved in this issue, ending the Black maternal health crisis in this country, what is one way that you can recommend that folks do to have an impact? Let's start with Congresswoman McBath. Well, as members of the Black Maternal um, Health Caucus, you know, we absolutely must continue to push this issue nationally and also within our own party. I mean, it's very critical to do that. The Momnibus was a really great first step, uh, building consensus around this bill with the medical community and also uh, legislation uh, really, puts, um, really puts us in a direction of more meaningful steps towards addressing uh, maternal health disparities and inequities. And there's so much more to say, but I want my colleagues to be able to say what's important to them as well. Thank you. Congresswoman Sewell. Well, I think that obviously the first thing that they should do is call their congressmen and their senators so that, that we can move the legislation, um, the uh, Momnibus uh, legislation and pass it. But I also think that it's important that not only should we think federally, but we should also act locally. I think it's important that we know who our Black uh, healthcare professionals, our doctors, OBGYNs, we promote them. We, um, we do our part in making sure that we're informing our neighbors and our family members about the importance of prenatal care. Um, but I also know that there are lots of wonderful organizations out there. There's the Black Women, Women's Health Imperative. Um, there's so many wonderful local organizations that one can get involved in. But I think it's really also critically important that we remember that we all must vote and we all have the power, especially right now, to fill out that census form. So much federal dollars flow through our US census. And so let's make sure that all of us are being counted because we do know that when black moms uh, matter, uh, that when black moms are healthy and deliver healthy babies, we all benefit. So I think that it's important that we in the halls of Congress do our part, but it's also really important that we be self-empowered and know how uh, we can um, make a difference right where we are. Thanks, Congresswoman Sewell. Congresswoman Presley. I associate myself with all the comments that have already been offered, and I'll just 
uh, say that the reason why this issue has been elevated to uh, national discourse and to uh, responsive legislation on the city, state, and federal level is because of the power of all of you and your stories. So I just want to encourage people, you know, in addition to uh, making sure that any person that they're considering voting for, that they ask them where they are on the issue of the Black maternal mortality crisis, hold them accountable to that if they're running on the federal level, uh, insist that they join uh, the Black Maternal Health Caucus, but keep telling your stories. The reason why people know this is a crisis is because loved ones, surviving family members made sure that their loved one's life was not in vain and they're doing everything to make sure that this tragedy doesn't occur, um, doesn't, doesn't happen to anyone else. So your stories are powerful. That's what moves the needle. So keep elevating and amplifying your stories. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley. And Congresswoman Kelly with the last word. Well, I was going down the line and, and then the last thing I was going to say after Terry spoke was tell your story, but then uh, uh, Ayana said that, but ditto to everything uh, all of our colleagues have said. And the, I would just say, keep the pressure on us. Keep the pressure on us and whoever your congressperson happens to be. So thanks again, Lauren. I'll end with Thanks that. to our incredible panel of members of Congress. I mean, to have this kind of star power leadership in the United States Congress to make sure that our moms can deliver our babies and live and support their children and support our families and contribute in our communities. This is why we do the work. Thank you, colleagues, for being here. Our final quit, our Twitter question for today's session is how will you advocate for the momnibus and other policies to improve Black maternal health outcomes? As you respond to us on Twitter, I wanna thank all our colleagues for joining us on the panel today. I'd like to thank the, the great Stacey Abrams, um, our sponsors, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and the American Hospital Association. Thank you for hosting this session. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, especially all the staff who worked so hard to transition this year's conference to this virtual format online and everyone who joined us virtually. Thank you for all that you do. If you are feeling inspired by today's conversation, there are steps that you can take right now, right now, in order to help us advance this critically important policy, pass the mommy bus and move coverage expansion forward. Talk about black maternal health with family members, friends and neighbors. Keep this issue at the forefront of our national conversation. One, you don't know whose lives you can save, but also we can pass these bills. Secondly, keep up to date with the work we're doing by following us on Twitter at BMH Caucus and online BMHC hyphen underwood.house.gov. The links are on the screen and our caucus Twitter account will keep you updated on all of our progress we're making in advancing the mommy bus and other key policies. And our caucus website is filled with information about the issue, our legislation and what we're doing. Be sure to contact your member of Congress and urge them to co-sponsor the Black Maternal Health Mommy Bus Act. In the House, members can also co-sponsor each title of the Mommy Bus, which were introduced as separate bills too. Adding more co-sponsors continues to build momentum to pass these bills. There's a fierce urgency about this work. We can't rest until we pass the policies that ensure that Black moms can access the care, support, and social services we need and deserve. Thank you all so much.